Welcome back everyone to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today is a lecture one, really we start with a course with interesting materials. Uh, the name of the lecture is High Performance Computing, so it's really an introduction to high performance computing, but we will here and there already go to some details that of course here and there in the next subsequent lectures will be then more explored, things like distributed memory, shared memory, what that means, how you program them. But before we go into the material of the lecture one, let us review what we did the last time. And the last time was really a practical lecture, which I tried to convene, um, you know, basically all things which um, are more or less required from Unix for the course. There will be a bit of more commands coming um, really dealing with Unix in HPC is necessary. Um, if you want to work in this field, it's really um, the operating system of choice. We have seen some Windows clusters. We have seen um, basically other systems, but uh, basically these systems require Unix knowledge in order to at least have the baseline ready. Things like creating directories, of course, we have discussed but also understanding perhaps here and there the distributed nature, what you see here is host name minus A, which directly shows you that essentially we have, let's say, remote systems we connect to. But then also, of course, dealing with the um, idea of the module environment that we learned last time, where we basically said like the, there are lots of pre-installed software here already available on these supercomputers. And there's a so-called module environment where you can module load specific modules like the Python in a specific version here. And the benefit was really, we have different, let's say versions available. Now this is another software and it's basically available directly via Unix commands. So you have module avail, module spider, module load. But this again shows you why Unix commands are so important to understand of course, basic Unix, um, like I say here, like who am I, um, the, gives you also an interesting insight of um, who, what is your real login. By the time you're logged into the system, usually you should know your username and you should know the host name and why is that so? So basically these are the two key requirements that you need to know in order to basically log into a system as we call it. We talked already that these systems, let it be the deep test cluster that we're gonna use in the course or our U-turn teaching cluster are remote systems. They're not your laptop machines. They are basically accessible via the internet here and there only via the internet of the university or so, but still they are remote and you have to log into the system. So login requires your username. And then of course, the other aspect is it which is a direct URI you want to basically um, go into, you want to basically connect to. And for this, we have used the so-called secure shell protocol where we can log into another HPC system, which is away from my laptop. And I can use two different principles. Um, we'd have that done last time. And I showed you some demonstrations how that really works, where the one was really then our deep test cluster, where essentially you have a specific remote host that you put in an SSH client that you see here. This was the example of the mobile X term client, but you can use any other SSH client like Putty or Unix derivatives. Of course, if you drive a Linux somewhere, um, you can also use a command line for the SSH. It, it really doesn't matter. What much more matters is that you know your specific username and the specific host name. And basically these systems have different policies when it comes to authorization, to authentication and so on of users. And this particular one where we said the deep test system is very similar like many HP systems worldwide which are in operation and production. Production means really users use it every day for scientific and engineering problems to simulations for AI. But the key essence to take away is really those systems are always protected with a private public key pair usually. So you would find very rare systems outside in the field in HPC, which are just 
accessible by username and password. So the SSH key principles here, um, basically based on RSA with public private key pairs we discussed last time, is a very fundamental approach that you basically will see when you use any other system in Jurlich, in Barcelona, in America, in China, they all have these um, basically approach. And how it works, we discussed last time a little bit. So you would have a private public key pair we already discussed. And important is that you never give the private key away. It should always remain on your server or on your laptop. While the public key you basically upload, and some of you have already done the assignment, so you update maybe UDOR and upload your public key there in order to get access to the deep test cluster. This is no harm. The public key is basically useless. It's your public information. You can basically upload it, no problem. But the, this only works, of course, if you have the matching private key. And there, this is sensitive information. The private key should not and never be uploaded anywhere. It should be not given to your best friend, to your research group as a professor. So don't give it to all your different students. Here, the key idea is, of course, it reminds your only private key. And the only way how to access them, these systems protected by keys, is usually that the public key is then basically checked during the connection setup with your private key. And only if that matches, you are allowed to get in. There's usually no workaround that works in terms of trying three times and then get a username access with a password or so. Usually that's not the case. You rather actually put on a blacklist and cannot log in for a while because you have three times uh, did it wrongly. Now, we also discussed in the course this U-turn cluster. And of course, um, this is a very complete different story. Here we talk about a machine that is purely for teaching, while deepest and deep systems are really for testing in the science and engineering community by real users. U-turn is more or less just a teaching cluster. So the protection, let's say, against um, takeovers and so on is relatively um, basically put at less risk because it's not the most attractive system outside. But for us in teaching, it's still a very nice cluster where we can play around what we can use to really, you basically get your initial ideas, how to program in parallel um, and so on forward. Here we have a system which is protected by username password as we learned the last time, but also um, take away the message that this is in the internet. So you need to be inside the university network and from there, and um, basically can log in. If you're not in the university network, there's usually a workaround that works. But this also, of course, requires that you can already log in to another system called Krafla here um, that we basically discussed the last time. And once you are inside Krafla, you can also, within the net university network, then make another jump, if you like, to with SSH, as you see here, um, then on the Yotun system. You also realize with Riedel 1 on Deep and with Morris here on Yotun, I'm completely different identities, I have different usernames on different systems, and that's also usually practice. But let us come now back to the first lecture of the course, really. The other ones were more or less a bit of warm up and the prologue, of course, a little bit what you can expect from the course and so on, and more administrative topics like what we do in terms of assignments, exams, quizzes, and so on. So high performance computing is now the first lecture that brings us some basics. We will discuss a little bit key building blocks of HPC, and we cover all of them, of course, in more detail in the subsequent lectures, and we'll here and there highlight a little bit the role of visualizations along the way. It's a very important list in computing especially if it uh, related to supercomputing. This is the top 500 list where we basically have performance benchmarks of the best computers in the world, which then makes them supercomputers. So here we have the term supercomputer that we try to understand. And still we want to understand some key building blocks like the multi-core CPU processor, what is parallel computing, what's the difference between shared memory and distributed memory, um, architectures, and then really how you have this hybrid architectures that are more or less practiced today and how that relates to some programming complexity. We also will there discuss a little bit the modular supercomputing approach I was alluding to already in the prologue. 
Then from the ecosystem technologies, um, here we're really thinking a little bit about more broader, um, the software environments. Um, what about the normal you know, CPU and how we go ahead of it? So what could be additions to a normal CPU? We all probably know. And one of those is a GPU, so the graphical processing units, which is basically uh, having a high drive these days for um, deep learning, for machine learning applications, but also for many scientific packages and applications. But there are, of course, many others on the horizon, like graph CPUs, like neuromorphic CPUs, and some of you have already heard from Quantum. So we will discuss this a little bit in this second part of this uh, lecture today. And with this, I also want to give you some common ideas about system architectures, network topologies, what constitutes really a HPC machine, uh, and then basically what means supercomputing co-design. What about the situation in Iceland? So where are we? How it relates to the Euro HPC joint undertaking, which is also very important now in the light of the new course here. Um, many of you maybe that know a little bit already about this PRACE, that is a large scale infrastructure for science and engineering in HPC since a long time and elements of those are now transitioning towards your HPC and we will talk about it. And I end the lecture a little bit with a small hint of what we do already in quantum computing. It's not future. Um, we have already several publications. We have a physical system in Jülich, for example, which will be inaugurated actually next week. And with this, we all basically can, um, you know, see that quantum computing is not really the future in a long, long, long distant future. It is there today. And this is also an important example of HPC. New technologies come around like GPUs 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago, and suddenly they are there. We deal with them, new programming paradigms. And this is also what HPC makes it so interesting. So let us start um, with thinking about the learning outcomes here. We deal a little bit with the latest developments really in parallel processing and HPC. Of course, on a reasonable, let's say moderate level still, we will not go in deep MPI programming, um, but still you will understand the, the complexity of parallel programming. What means when I cannot access a memory, which is usually very important for computing. So when you can't do that, how you deal with it. You have, let's say, message passing, you have distributed memory, but how that all works with a kind of architecture that then creates this HPC machine. And with this, we are basically also able to think about how we can create and use those HPC clusters, really, because you will also realize it's part of this lecture. <coughs> they are all basically based on smaller parts, like recs, note cards, and so on. And this brings a lot of chips together. So let's start with the real part one, where we try to reveal a little bit what a supercomputer is. And it's a loaded term, perhaps, a supercomputer. Um, and here's a definition. If you want from Wikipedia, you'll find many others. There's perhaps not the one and only definition around it, but they all share the common view of that it's really the formula one of computing. So here you talk about computers really being at the front line of the processing capacity, capability. And with this, we can solve problems we never can solve before, or we basically can solve problems with a much more granularity, with much more understanding, which are more precision. There are lots of good examples why it is a supercomputer. And when you talk about the course topics in a way, you can categorize them in these four building blocks, which I would say is roughly what HPC stands for. And if you want to read more about this, there's also this book I mentioned in the prologue here, the introduction to high performance computing for scientists and engineers. It's a quite interesting book for this building, basic building blocks. But still, when we go for other topics, we go more for references online or in the community. So we would see that HPC includes theory, a lot of theory. So physical models, which are the applications we run on the systems, um, we want to understand the speed up in some of the lectures, which is really the idea of saying high performance. So we have to measure performance to understand the speed up. Does it really use or is it useful to really, you know, basically combine different CPUs to tackle a problem? So this is what we want to analyze. 
We do performance analysis to understand problems, bottlenecks, and that makes it also HPC. There's lots of technologies out there and the whole of the course you will see with many cores, multi-cores. Uh, we have different network topologies, Dragonfly, uh, basically relatively new now when you compare it to maybe 15 years ago. Again, storages with storage hierarchies, caches. So this will be all parts of the course. Every now and then we will review this. And this lecture starts a little bit with the technology blueprints of shared memory distributed memory, which makes it certain different architectures, um, because you can combine these technologies, of course, in different ways. You can have different interconnects. Uh, the interconnect here in HPC is very important. Basically, you see that a little bit explored here um, in this kind of figure, where computing is a very important part in HPC, no doubt. But of course, the interconnection between those different nodes and so on is a very important part with, you know, high interconnects like Mellanox provides, for instance. And then there's software libraries, applications, but also administrative tools like monitoring and schedulers and so on. And this is also one of the ideas I will provide to you actually tomorrow when we talk about essentially um, then uh, the other practical lecture one one. So the next lecture will be really, again, a practical lecture where you show a little bit of what means really scheduling. Um, so this will be more practically then, but very important for HPC, uh, meaning that there are lots of different users on one system at the same time. So again, when we think about the high performance computing term, these are definitions which are more or less principles. Really, uh, in computing, you would say high performance computing is really computing, but has a very high in performance interconnect between all of those different cores. No matter how many of those are existing, the interconnect is very well, so you can use them brilliantly in parallel, um, basically with low latencies to it, and can enable certain applications where your neighbor or getting the connections and the communication to the neighbor is incredibly important, like weather forecast, for, for example. Now, another term which stands the test of time is high throughput computing. and this is usually where we basically contrast HPC a little bit. We would say there are lots of computing maybe in different cores, but usually they're not so much well interconnected. They maybe just use Ethernet um, and you come to a situation where the network connection is maybe also not so important. An idea is maybe if you look through many documents, let's say 20 million documents in terms of a network provider, um, or a news provider, if you want. A news provider might be a good example where you have, let's say, different topics about politics, sports. And if you want to basically do some statistics on this, how many basically have been in sports, how many have been on politics, how many news articles have been run, you just can do this by breaking up the big problem into smaller chunks, let's say, of a couple of millions and putting them to the different computing entities. In between, they don't have to interact. They don't have to talk to each other. They can solve the problem more or less independently parallel or nicely parallel, as some in our community would say. So the interconnect is not so important. You maybe want to have summary statistics, of course. In the end, you want to have the big picture, but this doesn't require on every little second to interconnect or basically to communicate then really with your neighbor and this is, of course, a complete difference if you think you would use these six here for weather forecasts and they want to basically predict the weather. And in order to compute the weather every little second, you need information from your neighboring CPUs or cores or whatever it is you parallelize on. And with this, these two different principles stand and it's very important to know by heart. I also give a short indicator that in our complementary cloud computing big data course, we focus here and there much more on the HTC paradigm, which is also much more often in clouds. Although some HPC machines, of course, are also part of basically clouds today. Now, when it means parallel computing, we usually say that all these different processors um, basically solve some form of a problem of a scientific challenge, of an engineering construction simulation, but in a kind of cooperative way. They work all together to solve that problem. And it's known as parallel processing and so on. But here, it's very important also to think about 
that this of course not only means pure computing. If you have real engineering problems or scientific application, you will see that data, so parallel IO, input output also plays into the game. Now, of course, we want to do this with high performance, but before we do this, we also want to understand what high performance really means. And you see here in lecture three, we will go into much more details what this parallelization really entails and give you also some performance relationships and theory. But let us look a little bit what this top 500 list now is, how it is actually based and, and why is that existing? So essentially you think that, you know, paralyzing a problem could be always equal. So just throwing two cores or three cores at it, it will be of course double as fast or three times as fast as using just one core. But the, the interesting thing is that in HPC, many of these systems really are running a lot of applications where the performance as such is of course also very application specific. So here you see several parallel applications that really also drive the demand for HPC systems. An Airbus, for instance, that you have here, um, basically that is you know, modeled via so-called computational fluid dynamic simulations, um, point cloud examples, building the buildings back with basically clustering algorithms and HPC and all the engineering parts here. And you have a simulation over time, which is mostly interesting, like this wheel here. You see basically the turbine here of an aircraft. And there are lots of these visualization that really are a helpful tool to understand what's happening in these scientific simulations. And this is valid for brain sciences, for remote sensing, so using satellite images and then essentially spectral channels of light here, um, which makes it a cube for analysis in AI, which we will also talk about when we talk about deep learning. You see here um, the Aya Fetia Yukud, uh, where the particles really run over Europe and, and shut down the air traffic. So the visualization are really helpful and in a way are always alongside the HPC. Um, and this is because basically the simulations are usually very complex and multidimensional problems or phenomena, which really then helps to visualize so that basically people can understand it much better than just looking on multidimensional arrays, which are sort of uh, very cold. But here you really in an instant can understand the situation um, of this cloud, for instance, of the ashes that we have seen over Europe um, affecting the flights. And of course, the same is true for the pictures here from the aircraft brain and so on. So scientific visualization is very important. Um, it's really reducing the time to understand these complex setups. It also makes us understand that we often break the big problem in smaller chunks. You see here a very homogeneous cut of a 3D grid in the coastal area, maybe we want to understand a little bit, you know, what's happening um, here in one of the um, interesting fjords or so in Iceland. So you would model that maybe more homogeneously in the beginning. Once you have then really, let's say several structures, you would say you would go to a fine grained mesh and you see here the Formula One car where lots of computing is happening around with the airflow around that where the mesh is relatively small. You have other areas where the Formula One car is not affecting very much where the mesh is relatively coarse grained. And of course, the same is true for an aircraft wing in fluid dynamics. But um, of course, you can think about also that um, uh, this will be a topic we will talk about later on much more in detail so that you can better understand it. Or here you have also the blood pump that shows the, basically the velocity of the accelerated blood, uh, which should be inside the body. So no matter where you go in medicine, in earth sciences, in engineering sciences, it is essentially making the visible invisible, as we say, and really helps us the understanding. Also, when you come to the world of the small or the very small in particle simulations here, what is the density, what is the velocity of the particles? It's all something we talk about, but it's important to understand that this is usually a very important part of HPC um, to analyze it, to explore it, but also then to communicate maybe to decision makers and to basically other users what we will do with the data, what is basically the simulation about. Now coming back that um, these applications are now really driving the demand for high performance computing, but we still not really clarified what that really is. So who says it's high performance? 
and what are supercomputers. So there's one specific list in the world that nails it or anchor it a little bit. Of course, you would say that um, this list is, let's say, a bit uh, controversial because it just, you know, measures in a certain benchmark um, the best computing. But as I said earlier, the different applications have their different requirements, memory, computing, accelerators. So probably it's not that easy to say it's a most important system. You rather would say, what is the most important system for this and that application? And for this, also the top 500 list has created more lists now. So we have a green 500 list being more for the efficient energy efficiency. We have the graph 500 list for more graph problems to solve. And here's the top 500 list, which is, of course, the most famous one, where you see essentially the best computer in the world with 7 million cores. Uh, very inter interesting, a very specific interconnect. As I said, HPC is defined by a very good interconnect, while here Tofu interconnect is a very specific one from Japan. Uh, we, for instance, here in Jülich, having number one in Europe and number eight in the world, uh, currently have the InfiniBand and Milanox interconnect, um, which basically enables us also to use high performance. And in between is a large space, and particularly I want to highlight the power challenge here. So you see the, the kilowatts here, where basically Japan, number one, obviously, with 7 million cores, requires lots of energy, but is also a big footprint in money and also, of course, in our uh, responsibility to nature. And when you see that number eight here in Yuli, compared to the predecessors here, is a very high performance system being very energy efficient um, and having a fraction of the cores and a basically a modular system architecture as we already discussed before in our prologue lecture. Um, just for you to explore, I would encourage you to go to the top 500 list because it's a very interactive list. It's not so cold as it is shown here. Obviously, Europe. Um, has a part to play, but we see that in the last years or maybe the decades, I'm now 18 years in Jülich, we have been once number two or so in the world. And we in Europe actually fall more down these days and we see China and US, of course, being um, together with Japan, always basically the leading drive these days in terms of the top 500. But you see also Italy is coming again into the list and some European countries make it also to very large systems. But this is, of course, something you can explore much more interestingly, interactively when you go to the list statistics. For instance, you have things like vendors, chair, that might be quite interesting. EBM transformed to Lenovo, so still essentially uh, the legacy of EBM, so to speak, is still in the game. You have HPE, which is more or less uh, some parts of Cray, which you know some of you probably never heard as students, but Cray was a very long player in the um, HPC uh, community. So, and we have new players like Atos um, being, of course, very important in Europe, playing there a key part of uh, infrastructure and maybe uh, basically a vendor of HPC in the future in architecture uh, and so on. Um, for the countries, I have to say, um, we see that China, United States, and Japan really make a big race. The numbers change here and there, and last year China was a bit more uh, into the list, and now the United States actually pick up a little bit, and we see that some European countries are still in the game, uh, but it's really defined by US and Asia, largely saying China and Japan these days. So Germany, as you see, is still uh, a big player too. Um, over the years, we could could in Jülich at least sustain, and also more broadly speaking, with the Gauss Center for Computing in Germany, sustain also their high presence. But still, um, basically something in orders of magnitudes, as you see from the percentage. So explore the list. You will see other statistics. You will see details about the top 500. So Lindpack is a benchmark, um, which is used uh, solving a dense system of linear equations of an unspecified size. But with this also comes critics because most of those should be having much more realistic application benchmarks these days. And that's why everybody says in the community top 500 is important uh, for to see the general computing capacity, the capability. But when it comes to real applications, 
um, you know, this is not really the statement. You have to really go with application specific benchmarks to understand and really know if the system is really good for a certain application. So there are challenge benchmarks these days. There's a huge benchmarks with smaller real applications. And we see more specific ones like MLPerf, for instance, gaining attraction in the community of HPC, in particular in the context of artificial intelligence, where you see here some basically parts of it, image classification, natural language processing challenges. So this is another very specific benchmark where HPC is judged on. An interesting part also is one of the statistics in the list, where you see on the um, upper part here, of course, the, the sum of all these computing capacities, which now reached extra scale. Um, and you know, in the prologue, we discussed a little bit this 10 to the 15, 10 to the 18, where we're going to now. Um, and you see the lower part of the top 500, but also the upper part, meaning that we almost are there of having extra scale systems. So almost is a loaded term because exascale systems are quite a big endeavor and very costly. But we, uh, chances are that essentially in the next two years, 2023, 2024, we probably see the first exascale system um, stand alone. And then of course, also driving higher the summary of all the computing power in the list. Um, also here, this means in the development, in the directions you could see more or less, it is still growing constantly over the years, and there's also something we can expect in the future. Now, a little bit to the architecture elements, and actually some of you that have taken the cloud computing big data course, of course, have seen these basic parts as well. So we have now CPUs, and there is an ever-increasing amount of you know, power in the CPU, meaning there are caches, different level of caches, and you have, let's say, many more cores on it. But still, it's it's limited. It's not thousands, of course. Here we're talking about the multi-core chip that has single thread or high single thread performance. And the problem is here that these chips getting too hot and you basically end up with a problem that there will be too many errors in the chip. So you cannot advance there forever, creating more and more better chips. And as such, many core GPUs are now existing where the cores basically are not that powerful anymore, but you can put thousands on the chip. Still, of course, the systems that we have in the HPC systems are um, very powerful. We use cutting edge CPUs. Um, and with this, there are kind of two dominant types of architecture, shared memory and distributed memory. And what we see in practice when you go to a hall really, that basically those are more or less hybrid systems. <coughs> <clears throat> and of course, more recently, also accelerators play a much more significant role as, let's say, 15 years ago. So many core chips, graphics, cards, and so forth are very important today. So in a way, you would say that shared memory and distributed memory is more or less a view of programming models these days. And we will see also that programming models will evolve. If the future here at the end of the corridor, we see quantum arising, we see neuromorphic devices, so also a new form of programming all of those. So for shared memory, and of course, we will have in-depth lectures on this. You will program them as part of assignments. But in basically, shared memory, you see the idea of basically having always access to your memory, writing, reading variables, and you have different threads that can actually operate on that. Obviously, there's one important language called OpenMP, a standard, how you basically can program those. And in lecture six, we will talk about this. And of course, you can imagine you have also some um, unwanted elements like oh no, overwriting variables we will have to talk about, cache currents levels, and so forth. But in the end, with shared memory, you talk about lightweight, basically lightweight tools or lightweight threats. So with unified memory access, um, the shared memory will look essentially um, like really a flat memory model. So essentially all the same, uh, all the processes are the same and all the memory locations is also called symmetric multiprocessing. You see that a little bit here. So all have the same way to the memory, all these different cores or processes here. So <clears throat> they all have, of course, their level one caches, level two caches and so forth. So when you have the CC NUMA, the non-uniform access, 
you have this cache coherent link. So you see that essentially in order to go to the other memory, which is a form of distributed memory, but not really, it's still basically logical memory that is distributed, but still accessible in one logical way. So still a shared memory system. But of course, um, here's a protocol that's solving this problem of being distributed. And then you would have a distributed memory, which is really now talk about different processes where there's no way around that you can actually access the other memory. You always have to go to a so-called communication network. So you cannot just write and read in memory anymore and so on. You always have to send messages. And of course, this will be a big part in our coming lectures, also in your first assignment, to learn what MPI is all about, what means send, receive, what more means reduce, um, broadcast their so-called um, methods, which include, let's say, lots of different processes at the same time, collective operations as we name them. But the MPI is really a kind of um, de facto standard to program those, and we will learn about this a lot in lecture two and lecture four. So this is uh, really where we go into the practice very soon. And there's a MPI standard that we're gonna use that means many of the code parts you will basically have in front of you will be, let's say, standardized things like MPI send receive. The all API is a standard. And if you want, you can look into this website. You will see the different versions of the standards always being further developed. And for this standard, it's of course important to understand that there is an MPI implementation. And here we talk one <clears throat> specific one. There are different ones out there. Here's the open MPI implementation, which is an implementation for the MPI standard that you can then use maybe in C, in C++, but of course can also use in Fortran because many of the applications are actually still here and there running Fortran, but also new applications can use Python because there's also an MPI for Py, for Python. So a standard which has reached really the community standard level um, in HPC, everybody knows what an MPI code is and it's extensively used. And if you look in the practice, how systems are used today, you see hierarchical hybrid computers where basically people program shared memory within a node. But in order to basically have larger problems solved, you use distributed memory programming. And here hybrid in the end, that means you would basically combine the power of these systems and program um, shared memory inside and distribute memory basically across the nodes. And you would always have this very good communication interconnect. I always was saying in the beginning, which constitutes then HPC. It's usually also the most cost intensive part of a HPC machine, this communication network. So it's not easy to actually basically program hybrid. We will have a lecture on this where we will see what it means really to have these large systems today programmed. If you want to combine shared memory with you know, distributed memory, for example, uh, it gives you maybe here and there the best performance of an application. But on the other hand, it also requires quite some methods um, and quite some good understanding what the problem is and, and basically how you map that really to the technology. But these are things we will talk about in lecture seven just giving you an indicator of, of course, these days people combining these different activities. And if, if you want to have more complexity, of course, you have to even add the accelerators. And that's something what we deal in part two, but let us now have a short, um, basically video here from the Uli Supercomputing Center that also shows you a little bit what a supercomputer is, what the modular supercomputing approach is, and here some, let's say, practical insights. Wir können nicht hier so globale Experimente machen. Wir haben nur die eine Erde. Die können wir nicht als Labor benutzen. Aber mit den Simulationen können wir natürlich alles durchspielen. Unser Supercomputer ist wirklich einzigartig. Wir haben das modulare Konzept zum ersten Mal auf ein System in dieser Leistungsklasse angewandt. Forschung Zentrum Jülich und its partners have built a supercomputer that is setting benchmarks on a global scale. 
Upon its completion, Joules is the fastest computer in Europe and boasts unparalleled energy efficiency. With its enormous computing power, researchers can accelerate the development of medicines, investigate how the human brain works, and clarify fundamental questions regarding renewable energy and the climate. Crucial to its flexibility is the modular architecture developed at Forschungszentrum Jülich, comprising a cluster and a booster module, which are interconnected. In conventional supercomputers, thousands of identical processing units are combined. Some applications, however, can only make partial use of them. In contrast, a modular architecture works more efficiently. A universally applicable cluster is enhanced by specialized units. For example, an ultra-fast booster, a centralized storage system, or a module for data analytics and pioneering technologies such as quantum computers and neuromorphic chips can also be directly integrated. The advantage is that each task is performed on the module that is best suited for the task. Ja, in der Erdsystemmodellierung, da müssen wir ähm, also müssen wir ja unterschiedliche Skalen berücksichtigen, einmal auf der globalen Skala, aber die einzelnen Prozesse, die zum Beispiel für den Klimawandel relevant sind, die haben eine Skala auf Mikrometern und deren Bildung, das sind chemische Reaktionen, das heißt, die muss man sehr hoch aufgelöst haben. Und hier kommt die modulare Architektur ins Spiel. Das heißt, die besonders rechenintensiven chemischen Reaktionen können wir auf den sehr parallelen Booster auslagern, wohingegen der atmosphärische Transport auf den CPUs im Cluster über die Tausenden von Kilometern simuliert werden kann. Ermöglicht wird die Modularität nur durch die Software der Firma Patek. Sie erlaubt es, die verschiedenen Rechenaufgaben auf die verschiedenen Module des Systems zu verteilen. In diesen haben wir die schnellsten Grafikkarten der Welt von Nvidia, das schnellste Rechennetzwerk, das es derzeit gibt, von Mellanox und eine hochinnovative Kühlungstechnologie von Atos. Damit erreichen wir höchste Energieeffizienz bei allerhöchster Performance. Joules is a modular supercomputer that serves as a model for the supercomputers of the future. With its enormous computing capacity, it is already delivering completely new insights and findings. Okay, so that was part one of lecture one and see you for part two in a moment.